robots. What do you imagine when you think about robots? Maybe something like this. Friendly companions and helpers that are supposed to take us into a brighter future. Or maybe you imagine a more dystopian future where it's robotic overlords taking over every aspect of our life and using our bodies as batteries or something ridiculous. And while I'm a huge fan of sci-fi, as you may have already noticed, I would like to talk about more of a today's vision of robotics. Today we see hundreds of machines performing very precise, repetitive moves in a factory, assembly and manufacturing line environments, producing very high quality product. But what if what we wanted to make was not hundreds and thousands of the same thing, but rather a unique object every single time? And that is exactly where, for me, as somebody who is trained to be an architect, an artist and a designer, this conversation becomes really interesting. How can we use the technology that is already available in the industry and appropriate it to explore our relationship with the design process and with all of our creative practices? And this question is precisely what led me to where I am today. Today, I find myself incredibly lucky to be a part of a larger team of like-minded individuals. Architects, engineers, roboticists, computer scientists, and inventors. And we're all based at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction at the University of Stuttgart. Pretty close to here. And our main goal within our institute is to investigate how new methods of computational design and robotic fabrication can influence the ways we design, build, and create architectural objects. So we conduct this research through a series of real-scale prototypes. For those of you who live in Stuttgart, you might have seen a few of these. And we investigate, we learn, and we really explore through making, teaching, collaborating, and of course, building. However, my own personal um, journey into robotics and robotic making somewhat started counterintuitively with spiders. Uh, this is Diane. Uh, Diane has been a great friend and a collaborator for roughly six months back in 2013. I have to admit that I'm definitely a victim of severe arachnophobia, but I had to really overcome my fears for the sake of the fascination that I had for the way these creatures create and build. What is fascinating about spiders is not only the fact that such tiny creatures can build really large structures, but also they do so without having a plan or a blueprint or a drawing. They basically follow behaviors in order to create these incredibly intricate, beautiful structures that are also highly functional. What is interesting specifically about Diane and her overall species, Tegenaria atrica, is that these particular species have evolved to prefer our human-built environment as their tiny construction sites. So they use our walls, ceilings, corners, and tiny spaces behind our cupboards as very simple geometric formwork for, for their incredibly intricate structures. And that really got me thinking. What if instead of using large industrial machines in an assembly line, we could rather use smaller machines to build bigger things using already existing architecture around us as a formwork for a next layer of architecture? So, of course, quite obviously, I've started building my own robots. And that started with very silly, primarily not working, um, somewhat falling apart machines. And gradually, through a very painful process, I have taught myself how to build robots that work. And I did that through using technology that was available. I used a few uh, off-the-shelf available hobbyist hardware pieces, such as servo motors and various sensors. I also um, have admittedly disassembled a bunch of house appliances. They've never worked since then. And I've used some open source hardware and software such as Arduino. Um, I have also designed and 3D printed and manufactured some custom parts. And finally, throughout that process, I built my first robot. This is a wall climbing filament winding machine. And it consists of three main parts. The first one is the vacuum assembly that allows the robot to stay on the wall stably. The second one is a chassis, which is basically a set of motorized wheels that allow the robot to actually traverse along the surface. And finally, a custom manipulator that can anchor the thread or the rope onto pre-installed anchors. The robot can be operated in two ways. Autonomous, where it is relying on external locomotion, uh, external, excuse me, localization system, and can then navigate to a target position. Or manual, where it can be teleoperated for an incredibly high-tech gamepad. So these robots can also interact with another robot of the same type. They can pass a material cartridge that contains a little bobbin of rope from one machine to another. There we go. And besides doing that, they can also anchor this rope to anchors that are currently, unfortunately, being pre-installed by humans. 
We're still working on that. So this is what these two robots can do together. The two machines are positioned on two walls that are adjacent to each other, and through iteratively passing, anchoring, passing, and anchoring the rope, that can create three-dimensional spaces or structures. What is interesting about this process is that the robots, because they are mobile, they always have to know where they are in space and where they are in relationship to the other collaborating robot. So they're relying on a perception system that consists of an external camera. You cannot really see it in this video, but it's positioned opposite each wall, so it's always observing the whole workspace. And the camera allows you to track the current position of the robot and always correct for any um, disturbances that happen throughout the fabrication process. So the result of that project was what I see as a beautiful demonstration of what these tiny machines can achieve. However, my friend Becca, who you can see in this image, would argue that it was not the most comfortable piece of furniture in the world. There's always space for improvement. Reflecting back on this project and thinking again about spiders, I guess I've missed Diane too much, um, I've started thinking about how these creatures are so good at not only building, but also adapting to new construction sites every time they create a new structure. My system, however, would only work between walls that are positioned at a 90 degree angle to each other, and would definitely not work if the walls were not even touching. So how would you solve that problem? One way of dealing with that would be maybe building a new robot something that can jump or, I don't know, magically traverse between all of these surfaces, something of an increasing level of complexity. And while that does sound like a very interesting mechanical engineering task to me, it's also a little bit of an overkill. So what I've decided to do instead is I've decided to invite another robot to help out. And that is when I performed a series of experiments that I internally call Maria's apology to the industrial robot arm for being too exclusive. So here you add another machine into the system that pretty much already exists. Obviously, you have to change the software and the control system quite dramatically, but the hardware practically hasn't changed. But the amount of possibility that that simple addition uh, opens up is pretty fascinating. And what really interests me here is that by creating this symbiotic relationship between two very different machines, you can both extend the build envelope of an industrial robot and also help the mobile robot perform tasks it wasn't capable of performing before. And starting to think about these symbiotic relationships and being very excited about my multi-species robotic teams, I got a commission to do a piece that was three times bigger than anything I've built before. It, was, it had to be built on site in a gallery space in Italy within somewhat, I think, three months. A little bit terrifying. But since I was already excited about the whole multi-species thing, I've decided that a good approach to this would be to expand my taxonomy of spider robots and add a new one. So I've made what I call a thread bot. It travels in one dimension on a piece of thread or a rope that is already positioned in space, again, unfortunately, by a human. And then it does the whole passing routine, but now it just moves from one wall to another, covering pretty much any distance you need it to cover, helping the two wall climbers perform their functions. What was interesting here is that in order to make this project happen, I traveled to Milan with two suitcases. And those two suitcases contained all of the robotic parts that I needed to make this happen. The two wall climbers, the thread walker, a lot of spare parts, and I actually even managed to squeeze a couple t-shirts in there. And in 12 days prior to the exhibition opening, we were able to fabricate most of the structure. We had to switch between autonomous and manual modes due to some technical limitations that we had to face. But even more interestingly, we could continue running the robots when the visitors were already in space, not only demonstrating the outcome of the process, but the process itself. And we even managed to recruit a few visitors to teleoperate the robots from those very high-tech pads. Um, however, I had to admit that a, most of our recruited users were kids because they seem to be braver in these situations. And most of those kids were much more excited about the game pads than the robots themselves. So the outcome, the installation, the art piece, and more importantly, the process really demonstrates, again, how when using these machines to do what they're really good at and to do what they're designed to do, you can achieve a very interesting contrast between the simplicity and the scale of the machine itself and the complexity and the scale of the object it produces. Going back to Stuttgart with my two suitcases worth of robots, again, I started reflecting on that process. And the two main bottlenecks of that project were time. As you can actually see in this picture, some of the structure was never finished. We ran out of time and a few layers are missing. 
But another important bottleneck was because the robots are using a vacuum motor in order to stay on the wall, they require a lot of power. And that means they cannot be wireless and have to be tethered. So the robot can only move around this boundary of anchors that is defining the shape, but cannot move inside, which means that we're very limited in the types of sequences in which we can connect the anchor points. So first, addressing the question of time, it is pretty clear that in the system, each robot is spending almost more than half of its operational time just sitting there, waiting for the other robots to finish their task. And in order to address that, I thought, why don't we just add another thread walker and another material bobbin in order to create a simultaneous process between the two robot teams. And addressing the problem of cable, much more interestingly, I've decided to again expand my taxonomy. So I've built a new robot that I very lovingly call the sandwich bot. The sandwich bot is made just like a sandwich of two parts, um, in which the structure that it's climbing on becomes the cheese or the ham or whatever you prefer. So you can attach it onto a panel and then it just stays there without having to waste any energy, thanks to the magnets that are embedded both in the tracks and in the body of the robot itself. And then it can freely move along that surface, again, without spending any energy on not falling off. So this was the general setup that we used in order to test that system. Two uh, panel climbers and two thread walkers working together. And what was also interesting about getting rid of the cable is that now the anchoring procedure became much easier because you didn't need to have this complex winding mechanism anymore. You can just simply drive the robot around an anchor in order to create that attachment point. That means that we can continuously navigate in between the anchors, opening up a whole new possibility of new geometries that we can build with these systems. So together, these four robots create a sculpture. Again, this project was conducted in a gallery space on site, the whole thing was built before the exhibition opening, and the robots really stayed there while the exhibition was ongoing. And that is exactly why it is very important for me to conduct these experiments and show them within a, within a context of an architectural or an artistic exhibition. I really want to express how this is not just product, but really a process that is really fascinating to me. And hopefully that will encourage people to really rethink their view on robotics and what they mean for the future. So through these projects and through all of my investigations and adventures, I've learned two things. One, just like humans, robots of different sizes, shapes, backgrounds, origin stories can be friends. And they can really create systems where each one of them is using their unique skills towards a common goal, counting on its robotic cooperators to fill in the gaps. And the second thing I've learned is that building hardware is really hard. Things very often break down. They don't work the way you expect them to. And they just have their own nature and behavior that you cannot predict. But on the other hand, building hardware today is actually really easy. There is so much technology that is already available. There are so many open source hardware and software platforms that allow people like me, without any formal education in robotics, engineering, mechanics, or software, to build devices that actually work. And through building these devices, I can also explore my relationship with my own practice, with the way I design. Moving towards systems, we're designing the object, designing the process that creates the object, and designing the machine that is executing the process, all become part of one cycle. A single design undertaking that is moving away from what we used to have when we designed for the tools that are available at hand, and rather design with the tools, design the tools themselves, and then create new processes that were not necessarily imaginable before. So what I'm hoping to see in the future is that the species of robots that I've shown you today will grow into a proper robot ecology. And that ecology will incorporate both available industrial robots, the robots I have made, and much more importantly, the robots you have made. Robots that were made by a huge collection of users, be that roboticists and engineers, or artists, designers, and architects. And potentially, these robot species in the future will be able to cohabit our spaces. They will be able to construct right next to us, safely, without us having to worry about them. And they will change, construct, reconstruct, and adapt our urban environments to our rapidly changing and dynamic lives. Thank you.